So last week, we were talking about how Jesus serves as a great high priest. And we're going to find out as we go through the book of Hebrews that he's going to return. We're going to return to that idea and that theme. But the author of this letter, the writer who wrote this letter, he's pivoting from Jesus serving as the great high priest to actually the people that this letter was first written to. And it's very applicable to actually our lives today. So let's hear from God's Word, the book of Hebrews, the fifth chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. Although this we have much to say, oh, about this we have much to say, and that's about Jesus as the great high priest, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone again to teach the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. This is the word of God for the people of God still speaking today. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Doesn't that remind you of a father scolding his children? You know, that's what I first thought of. And it's just a coincidence. I didn't plan these verses to be here on Father's Day, but they're here as we work our way through Hebrews. And it made me think, you know, everyone has a biological father. And yet everyone has a different relationship with that biological father. Some have had a caring and loving father who helped them understand life and its responsibilities. They may have memories of a stern voice and strict rules, yet they know how much their father loved them. On the opposite end of that spectrum is people who have little or no relationship with their biological father. And between these two extreme opposites are all kinds of the different relationships that people have with their biological fathers. My own father left my mother and our, his children when I was in first grade. We had little to no contact with him as we were growing up. I can only speak for myself, I only want to speak for myself, but as I grew to a teenager, I had a deep sense of abandonment and a real dislike, even hatred of my father. And over time as I grew, I married Daphne, we had our two daughters, I was able to establish a relationship with my father. And I praise God that I was able to be reconciled with my father and have a father-son relationship, even if it was as adults. And I brought up this relationship with my father, not only because it's Father's Day, but to highlight how family dynamics play a role in our lives, not only growing up, but even as adults. And by family dynamics, all I mean are the ways that a family interacts with each other. It can be defined by the way they family members communicate with one another, their roles within the family, and how they handle conflict. And if we think of our basic family dynamics, we think what's called as the nuclear family that was in the 60s, it was father, it was dad who was a wage earner. Mom stayed home and raised the kids in most of our families here in America. And then that changed. Mom began to work. Some mothers now, they're the breadwinners, and dad stays home with the children. But most families, it seems in America especially, maybe around the world, but in our culture, they need both parents working. So the children are handed off to, you know, childcare. 
grandparents, family members, or they pay for someone to watch their children. And then in our world today, we have the families with two dads, two moms, single parents. So there's all kinds of family dynamics going on in our culture, in our world today. And I want to bring this idea of family dynamics and how it works into another type of family, the church family. We are all, as Christians, part of the body of Christ. That means we're all part of the family of God. And in these verses today, what I hear, I hear like a father-like figure sharing their disappointment with these children. These, he, must, he might have had, we don't know, again, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. He may have been someone who helped them learn about Christianity. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. That's not, that's not exactly grace-filled words, is it? He wanted to continue talking about Jesus and the heavenly priest, but he says he can't do that. Why? Because it seems like some, if not most, of these people have forgotten the very basics of their Christian faith. So what brought them to this point where they are? And the key word, a key word is in verse 11, that's translated as dull. This Greek word is used here, chapter 5, verse 11, and then the next chapter, chapter 6, in a verse. It's the only place in the New Testament that this Greek word is used, and the word is nothros, and it means slow, sluggish, literally lazy. This highlights that some of the people that this was written to were spiritually immature. That's also, we take that from the reference to the milk versus solid food. Solid food, that's pointing to that. What is milk after all? Our farmers can tell us it's pre-digested food. Animals eat something and then we get this fluid out of stuff that they have digested and we give it to infants. Why do we give it to infants? Because they don't have teeth. They can't digest solid food in their bodies yet. They aren't quite ready for solid food, so they have to have milk. And God's saying in these verses, I believe, that we, each person, is responsible for their nurturing their own faith. God doesn't want us to be stagnant in our faith. He doesn't want us to remain drinking milk in our faith. He wants us to move on to chewing food. An important part of growing our faith is learning to apply God's word in our lives today. What does this part of God's word mean in our lives today? As we read and we hear the Bible, we need to think what it means in our lives. And I also want to point out it's important that we don't need to we aren't supposed to take God's word and apply it for other people in their lives that's God's job our job is to apply it in our own lives Jesus tells us not to worry about that speck in other people's eyes Matthew 7 3 says why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eyes but you do not notice that log is in your own eye and I do this a lot, I have to confess. Maybe you don't, but I sure notice a lot of specks in people's eyes while I've got a big log in mine. Why do we do that? The simple answer is that we haven't fully matured in our faith. We still have room to grow. And if I want to I want to circle back to that story of my father, the relationship I had with him. You know, those feelings I had as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, they were real. They were based on my personal experience as I saw it. And that fractured relationship was extremely disruptive in my life. And likely was the root cause of the problems I had later in my lifetime. Things I had to deal with in my life at some point. Yet as I matured, emotionally and spiritually, I was able to be reconciled with my dad. I was able to understand his perspective. You know, you don't have to approve of something 
to understand something. You know, being able to understand someone else's perspective is a sign, just one sign of maturity. We're all on a journey, a journey called life. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, nothing remains the same in our lives. As we age, we go from an infant to a child to a teenager, a young adult, we're going to hit a physical peak, and then we're going to decline. Our minds can also decline due to age or disease. This can affect our emotions and our mental and well-being. People take steps to help fight off that physical decline. They exercise. They try to eat the right thing. Maybe they take supplements and vitamins to help their mental facilities. But the truth is, no matter how hard we try, we can't stop that physical de decline. No matter how hard we work at it. We all, you're all with me, I know, but you hit an age and then pff, that body just starts breaking down and feeling a little different than when you're 20 and 30. <laughs> Something that should not decline, though, is our faith. Just like keeping our bodies fit through exercise, when we work out and we exercise our faith, it helps us to keep it growing and help keeps it strong. God's word even tells us to work on growing our faith and understanding. In Paul's letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, Paul writes, have nothing to do with irreverent Silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The complaint that he's making is that this body of Christ, they've been Christians for many years, and most of them are still infant-like in their faith. They still need someone to teach them the simple, basic, rudimentary elements about Christianity. They've not been training for godliness. And whoever wrote this, and God speaking through that person is using this to, to tell us, he's upset that after many years the people never got past the basics. They're like children who don't know the difference between right and wrong. You know, here, through God's word, God's pointing out a problem that haunts the church in every generation. There's Christians who refuse to grow up. A Christian can refuse to grow in their faith and their understanding of God. They're content where they're at, no matter where it is. There's Christians who, who their faith has had little or no development for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Grown men and women, they're insistent on remaining content with their religious development like that of a little child. I'm happy where I am. We need to take advantage of the world we live in, the technology. We have Bibles. You can have Bibles with two or three translations, the literal translation and the, the, the paraphrase. And you can pull up and listen to God's word on the go. How can we rightly handle our Bibles, the word of truth, God's word, if we aren't reading it, if we aren't asking questions about it, and we're not finding why, ways that it applies to our lives today. The choice is ours. If we want to grow in discernment, being able to chew up and digest more of God's truth, we have to work on it. Today's scripture, verse 16 again, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. It's saying we can't learn and grow our discernment unless we work 
out our spiritual muscles. And if you agree that we, we believe that God wants us to grow in discerning between good and evil, God wants us to know when evil's coming at us, then certainly the helper of the Holy Spirit is going to help guide us. We should never forget that God's grace flows into our lives to help us. John Wesley taught that God's grace is unmerited. He gives it. We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us. And we're not able to idly wait around to experience God's grace. We can engage in God's grace in what he called means of grace. And these means of grace are just ways that God works invisibly in believers, hastening, strengthening, and confirming our faith so that God's grace pervades in and through God's people. He called these means of grace. And most of these aren't anything new. They divide them into works of piety and works of mercy. Works of piety include reading, hearing, meditating, and studying God's word. Prayer, fasting, regularly attending worship, Holy communion is a means of grace. Sharing our faith with other people is a means of grace. Works of mercy, as individuals, we can do good works such as visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, and giving generously to the needs of other people. And then in community, communal practices of mercy, we join together, we work together, seeking out justice, ending oppression and discrimination, and addressing the needs of the poor. Our Methodist heritage insists that we don't sit stagnant in our faith. Think about this. The God we believe in, the God, the triune God is infinite. God's word says the riches of Christ are unsearchable. And we should be moving forward until God welcomes us in our eternal home. In order to grow from infant Christians to mature Christians, we have to exercise and work out our faith. Again, in our faith, each person makes that decision. They can move forward. They can stay where they're at, or they can go backwards. Each person has to make that choice. We need to train our senses, our minds, and our bodies, our hearts, to distinguish between good and evil. Discernment is a powerful tool. It helps us to keep us on the right path. John Wesley was concerned about the lack of, of spiritual growth among the people. He strongly believed that Christians should be more than just saved. Wesley believed that they could also be made perfect in love, is how he called it. And this wasn't his understanding of being made perfect in love isn't based on moral perfection, but on a heart that is habitually filled with the love of God and of neighbor. Wesley asked, are you going on to perfection? He believed that this kind of perfection was possible through the power of the Holy Spirit and he encouraged his followers to go after it, to strive, to go on to perfection in this life. And that question, are you going on to perfection, became a central part of Methodist spirituality. It's a central part of Methodists. It's a reminder to us that Christians are expected to grow. It's a lifelong process. And it's possible to experience a deeper level of intimacy with God, our Father. No matter how far you've come, no matter how much you love God right now today, no no matter how much you understand God's word, you can still 
experience a deeper intimacy with God before you move on to glory. Ultimately, that question, are you going on to perfection, is a challenge to all Christians. Are you intentionally taking steps to move forward in your spiritual discernment? Are you chewing on the solid food of Christ? Or are you content? Are you happy just drinking the milk in your faith? There's a danger in remaining an infant in our faith. And I know this because of having little wailing around. And if you have little ones around or you've had, you'll remember this. See, little ones lack an awareness of what might cause them harm. Spiritual infancy, not being able to discern good from evil, can cause people of God great harm. As we reflect on these verses this coming week, let us ask ourselves the following questions. Am I growing in my faith? Am I becoming more mature in my understanding of God's word? Am I following God's will for my life? If we can answer these questions honestly, we'll know where we are and where we need to grow. We can, we can have a goal. Here's where I'm at. Here's where I want to go. And we know God through the Spirit and His grace will work in our lives to help us accomplish that. So let us commit ourselves to growing in faith and discernment so that we can become more like Jesus, even if it's just a little tiny bit more. That's my play. I want to I be just a little bit more of Jesus. A little bit more like Jesus. Because that's a way to bring glory to God. Amen.